yeah, relative to, to yeah. because then it's more casual. Yeah. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you all for spending the day here with us. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Chan, and I am the Director of Scheduling and Special Assistant to U.S. Small Business Administrator Karen Mills um, at the SBA. And I want to again say thank you again for all being here. Um, you guys have heard a lot today. There's been a lot of information um, that you guys have been absorbing from a whole lot of speakers. And we're going to kind of continue on that track here, talking a little bit about financing. You heard from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Eccles, earlier in the opening plenary talking about the three Cs. The one we're going to focus on here is capital, uh, financing for uh, small businesses, for entrepreneurs, for a whole variety of um, different, uh, pro through a whole variety of different programs. Uh, so to kick this off, I thought I, I would introduce our first speaker. Uh, John Moon here is uh, the Community Affairs Team Leader and at the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve System. Um, prior to that, he also worked at the CDFI Fund for New Markets Tax Credit Program. He's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what happened in the last couple of years in terms of financing. You know, everyone, I think, has probably heard something along the lines of, you know, it was hard to get a loan. It's hard to get to find money. It's hard if you're trying to start a business, keep your business going to get that financial resource um, to succeed. And John's going to walk through for a little bit for us exactly what he saw and what um, the Federal Reserve saw as as kind of a history lesson for us. So, John, if you don't mind coming up for just a few minutes and giving us a run-through, that'd be great. Complete and accurate paper. Providers have more accurate and complete information. Good afternoon. Thanks, afternoon. My watch is almost 3 o'clock. Um, so my name is John Moon. I'm uh, with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors uh, in Washington, D.C., and it's a, a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, this topic of AAPI entrepreneurs is very uh, personal to me. Um, my, my parents were um, uh, immigrants, and uh, I'm, I'm a product of the classic Korean story of parents coming in and, and owning uh, little shops here and there, and, and just seeing how, how much hard work it, requ it required my parents so that you know I could have uh, more opportunities. And so I, I, I really appreciate the importance of, of this issue, and, and I actually did some work on it earlier, um, two years ago, when um, related to real estate and, and the need for financing from a collateral standpoint uh, from personal real estate uh, values. But, but what I'd like to do, though, is, is to try to give you an overview of just general financing conditions for small business businesses, and then talk about um, a set of meetings that we've had and, and what we've done at the Federal Reserve uh, around small business, and then just really talk about um, maybe some of the key opportunities from a policy standpoint of how um, the API sector and, and entrepreneurs can, can leverage the interest and the work that's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> small business, as, as we all know, is central to the economy. It's an important issue and, and, and an issue that um, the Federal Reserve takes very, very seriously. Um, we are, um, in fact, um, a group of us are, are briefing uh, Chairman Bernanke next week just on this very issue. And so um, insights and, and, and uh, what, we he what I hear today uh, would be appreciated um, so that we can really have a full picture of what's happening in uh, uh, the landscape around Asian or, or small business as a whole. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, give you a quick set of slides that shows um, sort of a bad story, um, but some Im improving trends. So um, this slide here shows um, small business lending dropping uh, during the financial crisis by loan size. Uh, take a look through 2007, 2009. Th these are the total dollars of small loans uh, to businesses outstanding at banks and thrifts, um, segmented by uh, different loan sizes. The, the orange line at the bottom is uh, the smaller segment loans, uh, loans 100,000 to 250,000. The blue line is a million dollars and everything in between. As you can see, uh, loans outstandings held at banks started to drop uh, um, through 2007 and 2008. Um, this next slide is loans outstanding by numbers. Uh, the other one was uh, loans outstanding by dollar size. The, the thing that, to note is that you see the drop in, in, in lending by banks from 2008 to 2009, but now as we enter uh, and come out of 2010, 2011, um, we see lending picking up, and, 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 and that's a, a good sign. Uh, and, and I think it's reflective of the positive labor numbers that we just heard today. How many of you have ever walked in a um, this is um, another data set that shows um, the red line is uh, banks who issue credit cards and then the net percent change of small business loan originations. Um, this is a fairly depressing slide uh, because it covers uh, from the period 2007 and 2009. You see that um, 
um, generally speaking, at least 80 percent, or at least uh, the, the banks report an 80 percent drop in small business credit card lending. On the small business lending side, um, you see at least a drop of at, uh, at least 30 percent. So uh, we, we know that credit and the, the availability of credit dropped significantly during the financial crisis. Um, finally, this last slide um, is, is uh, based on a survey of, of banks, or I'm sorry, of small businesses, um, and no, I'm sorry, this is the senior loan officer. Okay, so what basically what it's saying is that banks had reported significant tightening of lending standards uh, from uh, 2006 to 2008. You see that huge increase there. Um, as we came out of the, the financial crisis, um, the fewer uh, banks reported uh, tightening lending standards, and then we see at the very tail end a little bit of a pickup. Uh, it may be an anomaly, but, but the, the thing is that it's an improving trend, and so uh, banks reacted quickly to the financial crisis by tightening their lending standards, preserving capital, and then as we come out of the recession, um, uh, we see, generally speaking, um, a, a relaxing of, of t uh, uh, lending standards. Now, what I'd like to do is just uh, give you a quick um, overview of you know what's happening on the demand and, and supply side. So, as as the Federal Reserve, as a bank regulator um, uh, regulating financial institutions, we heard from small businesses that were saying that they can't get access to loans. Um, they've applied and they were getting denied. Banks, on the other hand, were saying, "I want to lend. Lending is my business, and I can't find good." small business to, businesses to lend to. So what we're trying to do is, is trying to um, add a little bit of color uh, both to the numbers and the graphs that we saw and to try to understand the dimensions of you know, what's behind this tension of businesses who want small or credit and, and, and banks who say they want to provide credit, but yet we see uh, lending dropping precipitously during, during the, the crisis. Well, <clears throat> Just to give you a quick um, overview, so on the demand side for the small businesses, because of the recession, small businesses had slower sales, weaker collateral, reduced cash flow. Uh, in a nutshell, a small business, a general business profile uh, diminished significantly. They were less credit worthy a a as a whole. Banks on the other side, those who provide credit on the supply side, um, were facing uh, serious balance sheet constraints um, as, as they experienced losses within their portfolios. Um, they had some uncertainty around regulatory changes. They were uh, reducing the credit box. And so I, maybe the, the best parallel is when, um, when, when if, if you've refinanced on your mortgage, you would have experienced a much uh, more um, tighter, uh, much more rigorous process. And, and that was the same thing on the small business lending side. Banks were really cautious. They wanted to preserve capital. And so the credit box shrunk. Uh, if you're a small business, and we heard this uh, fairly frequently, if you're a small business whose sales haven't changed at all, you would find that your line of credit would be, would be reduced. Uh, and, and nothing's changed. Your, your sales are the same, but it's just really a reflection of how much financial institutions are reducing um, the availability of, of credit as a reflection of their concern about the overall economy, the overall concern about their bank health. Um, so, you know, I could get a little bit more into deep, uh, detail, but in the interest of time, let me just share with you a couple of um, things that we noticed around uh, certain areas of credit gaps. So, um, startup capital and credit was uh, notably across the board the most difficult to obtain. And this is really important because as Washington, D.C. thinks about job creation, the kinds of firms that create jobs are startup businesses. And these are entrepreneurs who were either unemployed and looking now as an incentive or as, as, as their incentive to begin to start their own businesses or just, you know, entrepreneurs who really have, you know, high growth and, and, and um, are potentially the gazelle companies. But across the board, um, whether it's uh, loans, bank loans or equity capital, uh, ca capital dried up significantly during that time. Um, other uh, credit gaps were loans less than 200000 lines of capital, working uh, capital, anything that um, uh, this was an area that um, small businesses showed a significant need for, which is that as they experienced uh, diminished sales, as they um, still had payrolls to meet, um, and they experienced cash flow constraints, they were looking to their lines of credit, um, working capital, and unfortunately for them, this is where they were really pinched because they, uh, those sources of capital from banks were extremely, extremely difficult to get. 
uh, refinance credit was another area that was difficult, made, diffi made more difficult because um, uh, as they refinance their assets, particularly commercial real estate, those values had diminished significantly, and so they couldn't refinance into um, a, another loan and, and again, uh, facing some serious uh, credit challenges. Uh, loans to certain industries, real estate, construction, retail, if you're in, in any of those industries and some others, it was extremely difficult to, to receive credit. Now, as we come out of this, um, three years ago um, at the Federal Reserve, the thing that we were concerned about and Washington, D.C. was concerned about was foreclosures. Uh, we're still concerned about foreclosures. Two years ago, the big concern was around neighborhood stabilization. What happens to all those communities um, as those foreclosed properties um, uh, languish? A year ago, it was small business credit. Today, it is about job creation. DC, the single most uh, important focus around uh, Washington, DC, and at the Federal Reserve is around job creation. And as we heard from Secretary Locke, as, as data show, jobs are created by new firms. And so this is an area, not only of the Federal Reserve, but in, in general, um, you know, as, I, as I've observed, if you can position and be ready to um, tap into the window of oper policy opportunity to tap into funds, this is an opportunity to um, really leverage um, uh, potential federal dollars uh, toward um, uh, different activities. And in this case, I think um, what's important is that with, with the concern around job growth, um, there, there is happening now and there will continue to happen now um, um, opportunities for high growth uh, and, and, and private capital uh, for, for high growth uh, companies. Um, we, we did uh, uh, finally uh, in, in our uh, look at different uh, types of small businesses, um, we, we did a couple of uh, meetings around uh, small or minority entrepreneurs. For minority entrepreneurs, um, the two uh, biggest challenges for them were uh, the lack of capitalization relative to other uh, uh, non-minority firms. Uh, generally speaking, minority firms were, were less capitalized than others and making it much more difficult, especially during the recession. The other one is, I think, more uh, germane to, to this discussion, which is that a lot of the minority businesses uh, said that they lacked the networks. Um, lacked networks with uh, uh, finance providers, lacked networks within their industry groups, and, and, and lacked networks just to talk about um, how to grow their business and, you know, how do you uh, improve your supply chain? How do you improve your customer base? And that's not only true for the, the black businesses, the uh, Hispanic businesses, but definitely true for the Asian small businesses. And in, um, you know, several initiatives uh, that Treasury's done, um, they're trying to increase that infrastructure for development so that um, there can be better funding, a, a better ecosystem to support um, uh, API small businesses and other minority small businesses. So in terms of job creation, in terms of a window of opportunity, I think that's an area that, um, that, that, that we, I think we could further explore as, as, as it um, uh, relates to API small businesses. So with that, um, I'm done. Thanks. So thank you, John, for that um, for that review. I think it was really worthwhile for everyone to hear kind of just what we, at least in D.C., have been seeing uh, and and kind of hearing what um, what it is that we want to do to what it is that we, we see as the future growth in terms of job creation being the next big thing. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I want to introduce uh, Mark Quinn, who is our district director for San Francisco and uh, the San Francisco region, which includes Silicon Valley, all here well, all for, for all of you me to uh, use uh, and, as a resource uh, to help us out. He's going to talk a little bit about... Uh, exactly what it is the SBA specifically has done to help ease some of that um, lending kind of tightening that John was talking about, uh, talk about some of the provisions and some of the things that um, we did to help try and get more money into the hands of small business owners. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I, I was afraid Chris was going to give my speech there. so. Um, one thing I want to do before I start, though, is to really get a sense of, of who is here. And I think for, for me, I think uh, any, any time that we have the opportunity to be in front of an audience of small business is great. But let me get a sense of how many folks here are either in the financial service industry or in some technical assistance providers um, group. A, a very good representation because you reach out and, and touch a lot of small business. How many of you are entrepreneurs or small business owners? Great. How many of you of those small business owners 
look for financing in this last year. How many of you thought that was a good experience? <laughs> Not so great. Um, let me talk a little bit. Chris mentioned that uh, I'll talk a little bit about SBA programs, a little bit about what the Jobs Act does, and, and, uh, and also how SBA programs can help you in your business. Um, first off, I really want to particularly thank John uh, for being able to talk about how the Fed is supporting uh, small business, because I think that from SBA's point of view, unless the bank regulator industry is also saying to small business lenders that lending to small business is an important thing to do, then we, we are all stuck. So the Fed has really been a good partner to SBA in, in reaching out to lenders and saying that small business lending is something that we want to see and encourage. So I want to thank you for that. Um, SBA, uh, as many of you know, has a couple of missions. You've heard a couple of things already. Uh, Secretary Locke talked a little bit about SBA, which I always love when another cabinet agency talks about SBA. Uh, Elizabeth Eccles talked a little bit about what SBA does. And we, you got a lot of numbers out there already, so you'll all forget the numbers at the end of the day. But the takeaway message um, really is that in this last quarter, the first quarter of our fiscal year that began in October through the end of last week, we did more SBA lending in the country than we did in any quarter in history. We did more lending in California in this last quarter than we did more than twice what we did in any quarter in history. And so the, the Jobs Act features that allowed us, if you will, the way I describe it is to put the SBA programs on sale, uh, allowed us to be able to expand significantly the, end, uh, the lending that we did last quarter. And particularly, it allowed us in California to expand our lending to, in total and to the Asian business community in California. Uh, something just to give you a sense of, you know, like I said, everybody gets boggled with the numbers. We did about a billion dollars of SBA lending in December in California. We've never done anything, anything even approaching that. Um, in the San Francisco area, in the market that I'm in and that, that we're in here, about a third of the lending that we do is to Asian businesses. Now, about, to give you some context, about 12% of the businesses in California are Asian-owned businesses, and we're doing about a third of all of our lending to the Asian business community. So we are significantly reaching a lot of the Asian business community uh, that in the, all of the SBA programs that we do uh, in a much, to a much greater degree uh, than any other community uh, that, that is in the San Francisco market in Northern California. The rest of California is actually quite similar. Uh, we do a lot of lending, um, more than twice the volume of lending to the Asian business community in this region than any other place in the country. And uh, for a variety of reasons. We have strong entrepreneurs. We have good, good networks of banks that know and, and work and, and reach out to small business. Um, and, and we have lots of really creative opportunities for small businesses here. So for us, this is really a rich market for SBA lending to the Asian business community. Um, I mentioned to Ellen that, um, that the comment that we, we are significantly overrepresented, if you will, or better present, represented in the Asian business lending side is, is matched really by the fact that we're underrepresented in the training and technical assistance side that we do to the Asian business community. And I think that that's an important thing to, to really uh, to take home. While we're doing a good job, SBA is doing a good job in reaching the Asian business community on our lending side, we're not being able to reach as many on the, the training and startup and technical assistance side. So I think it's an important thing for me, and when I talk about SBA, and, and I know that this is about financing, but it's an important thing to really also hammer home the fact that it's, a lot of this is about getting prepared. For small businesses that are looking for financing, for any of you who said that looking for financing in this last year was a, was a challenge, a lot of that is really making sure that you're really prepared for financing. And a lot of that is really making sure that you get good technical assistance. So in, in the Bay Area, and this applies across the state as well, in the Bay Area we have uh, small business development centers. Our SCORE chapters help people to get startup information. We have a good network of nonprofits that uh, provide technical assistance to the really small businesses looking for information about starting a business, developing business plans, and also those who are looking for microfinancing. Another part of SBA's program is supporting a micro lending program. So before we talk about the rest of the SBA lending programs, I do want to encourage everybody to keep in mind there's some resources and information that we have on the table out front. But keep in mind that a lot of being able to get financing is being prepared to get financing. So take advantage of all of that. Most of it's free. All of it's available throughout the, the San Francisco market. Uh, we have about 30 organizations that provide some technical assistance or financing advice about getting your business plan developed and starting your business. So first, 
take care of take care of business on that. Second, on the SBA lending program, uh, I mentioned that we did about a billion dollars in SBA guarantee lending. And of course, those of you who know SBA at least on some level know that we don't make direct loans; we guarantee loans. So we rely on the lenders, you know, that the Fed regulates and others regulate to be able to make the loans, and SBA guarantees the loans. In the last year. What we've been doing with the, first the Recovery Act and then the Jobs Bill was being able to guarantee a higher percentage of the loans. Uh, and, th and a normal SBA loan is really 75% or 85% of a loan. We increased that during this last year. But the normal SBA program guarantees, as I said, 75 or 80% of the 85% of a loan to a small business. And typically why a bank is looking to, to get a guarantee from SBA is your business is either too young, doesn't have enough collateral, too small, um, in many cases, in a, in a type of industry that's higher risk, say restaurants or uh, hotels, are in areas that SBA lenders say that a guarantee from SBA is necessary to, to make that loan. And the loan amounts vary from as small as a $20,000 loan to now up to $5 million loans. So we have a wide range. In the Bay Area, we have about 100 banks that do SBA loans. Again, there's a list of all the banks out on the table out there. But there's about 100 banks that do SBA loans. So we have a lot of lenders that are in the SBA loan program. We cover a wide range in terms of size, like I said, as small as 20 and as high as 5 million. And we also do a wide range of type of financing, from real estate acquisition to debt refinancing to uh, tenant improvements, um, you know, to business acquisition, and to, and to a lot of businesses to working capital, which is, a, in this environment, really a key to a lot of what small businesses need. A lot of the small businesses that, that John showed that quote on, the, or that chart on, about the fact that the uh, access to credit lines and credit financing uh, for, for working capital for small businesses was pulled back by a lot of financing sources has been what the environment that we have seen. This has been a tough last two years for small business. Every day I talk to a small business person that in some way has been challenged with the financing of their business. So the role that we play in guaranteeing lending and particularly being able to make available working capital financing is a big uh, advantage of the SBA program. Uh, because of the fact that SBA can do a t up to a 10-year working capital loan to businesses and up to 25 years in real estate allows a business to have a longer debt service and, and a lower, if you will, uh, debt um, that they would have to, on a monthly basis, deal with. Most small businesses I, I deal with see themselves as dealing with what's my break-even point every month. And so what's my debt service every month? So that longer debt service that SBA allows a business to have allows them to break even expand their business, have a profit, and hire people, all of which is really the mission of what SBA is about. So for, the, for all of you, I, I, I know we're going to have some time for question and answer, so I, I want to open, I want to be able to, to do that at the end of the session. But in general, I think a takeaway message that, that I'd like to leave you with is, number one, take advantage of good technical assistance that we have available. That's a foundation that's, um, that all small businesses need. You really need to go to a bank and say to the bank, I'm ready to get financing, and I have the answers to the questions that I know you're going to ask. You don't want to go to a bank and say, how much can I borrow? You don't want to do that. You do want to go to a bank and say, I know exactly how much I'm going to borrow. I know exactly how much I, I'm going to be able to pay you back, and I know exactly how I'm going to do that. And, and getting good technical assistance allows you to do that. The SBA programs, we have uh, microfinancing programs that do loans that are uh, really small loans, 1,000 to 50,000. The, the SBA 7A program, which is a loan guarantee program, does loans typically from about 20,000 on the bottom end now up to 5 million. And we do real estate financing through a 504 program, which does real estate financing, which is a high leverage real estate product, which in California has been a big part of what we've been doing. So we cover a wide range of SBA products um, and services to small business. Um, I, I'd really like to kind of uh, cut it short and leave the opportunity for questions at the end. But for any of you who are looking for financing, Make sure that you stop by the SBA table and take advantage of the information that we have out there. This has been a good year in this last quarter for financing for small business, and in particular for the Asian business community in California. But it's still a tough environment for small business, and all of you who are looking for financing uh, need as much help as we can give you. And for all of us, I should say my, my last message is, is that for all of us from SBA, we see ourselves as working for you. And it's really a privilege to work for you because it is such a tough job running a small business. And for those of us who see it and deal with you every day, um, I, I never cease to be amazed and, and, and be impressed by what you do. So thank you for what you're doing.
thank you, Mark, for um, those, those comments. And I think um, where we're going to go next is actually to talk a little bit about um, some financing that I think a lot of people here in Silicon Valley are very, very familiar with. Um, as, you, as John mentioned earlier in his comments, um, there's, there's your conventional loan financing, but then there's also equity, private equity financing, venture capital financing, something that uh, I hope, I think, introduces a lot of people in this room. I want to take this opportunity to introduce um, Ellen Kim, who's senior advisor um, in the Office of Investment and Innovation at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Uh, prior to that, she worked at the investment. She worked investment banking in the Municipal Securities Division at Citigroup, and was also a management consultant um, with Parthenon Group and uh, on her own. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about what the SBA is doing uh, in terms of innovation research and investments uh, on the private equity side. So, um, Ellen, take it away. Uh. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of their days to come here. I realize there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, so I know it's probably a very big sacrifice to take a few hours out of your day to come and listen to these programs, but we're, we hope you'll find a lot of value in them. So um, just a little bit in terms of my background, I'm a wannabe entrepreneur, so there's quite a fire under my belly to make sure that we're delivering services and programs and resources that can help all of you. Um, so just to set a little bit of context, so I think we've heard a lot in terms of data and numbers from Secretary Locke as well as SBA economists that are saying that it's the new businesses, it's the young businesses that are responsible for job creation. Thank you, Carol. We've also known from the SBA side that two out of every three net new jobs are coming Andy, from small over businesses. To you now. So you really have both small businesses and new, young, new and young businesses responsible for new job creation, and we're really focused on that. Um, however, from the small business side, a disproportionately high number of those net new jobs are coming from high growth, high impact businesses. So we're looking at businesses that have been termed in the media as gazelles, firms that um, by one metric maybe have grown 20% year over year for four years straight. These are the new, next Facebooks, the next Googles, the next Yahoos that are creating long-term, high-quality and sustainable new jobs. Um, so it's important that we focus on that, and within the SBA, that's where um, I'm located. So I'm in the Office of Investment and Innovation. Uh, slightly different from where Mark is focused, we're looking at some long-term private um, growth capital in, uh, programs, as well as some innovation research programs. Um, so as we think about at the SBA, we deliver on capital, counseling, and contracting. I think we've been a very relevant resource and partner for Main Street businesses, Sup very important with respect to creating vibrant local economies, but there are also ways that we can tailor those services to high growth small businesses. On the counseling side, thinking about mentoring programs for high growth entrepreneurs. On the contracting side, um, looking at our online systems, create, uh, easier portals so that entrepreneurs can come in and access opportunities across the different federal agencies, maybe with a one-stop shop portal, um, just being able to sort of get through the black box that is government contracting, we've heard is very important. And then on the capital side. So um, as we do that, I'd like to, I guess, both introduce and then highlight some of the successes for the Small Business Investment Company Program. So this is the SBIC program. This program has provided funding to well-known companies ranging from Apple, to Intel, Quiznos, the sun sandwich shop, um, Callaway Golf, and most recently, uh, one of the drill companies that helped rescue the 33 Chilean min miners um, was a company that was funded partly through SBIC money. So this is an important uh, source of long-term patient capital. So what I mean by that is these are 10-year maturity funds, um, very attractive terms for the SBICs, um, and the SBICs are licensed funds that the SBA administers um, but they are privately managed and privately owned funds. Um, so our SBICs are mandated to invest in small businesses. Small businesses here are defined as companies with less than 500 employees or tangible net worth less than $18 million. So it's actually quite a wide range of companies that the SBICs could invest in. Um, these fun the SBIC funds typically invest anywhere in the range of $250,000 to $5 million. So this is very important financing. You know, we're finding a lot after Angel, after Friends and Family, potentially pre-venture as venture keeps moving up the chain at $4 million plus. You know, I think this is really filling the gap in terms of early stage capital. Um, so the program that we have right now, so there's a participating securities program that's being wound down currently, but within the debenture program, uh, we had a really phenomenal year in fiscal year 2010, had uh, record high results over the 50 year program. And so I'd like to just highlight some of that. Uh, at the beginning of his term, my supervisor, Sean Green, made a commitment to double the number of funds in half the time. And so we thought, you know, that'd be 
uh, that was quite the undertaking, but I'm proud to pre uh, present that we did achieve those goals. Um, so in fiscal year 2010, we licensed 23 new funds. That's an improvement over an average of 10 funds in the prior four fiscal years. Um, we also uh, distributed a record $1.6 billion to small businesses through these funds. 29% of that money went to LMI, so low, low moderate income, and women and minority owned small businesses. So really made a commitment to make sure that the money was being distributed. Um, I know in Silicon Valley it sort of ex exists where the money is um, here and available, I th but I think across the country made sure that uh, the money was reaching various small businesses in various industries. Um, within that statistic, over $21 million from the SBIC program went to majority AAPI-owned firms. Um, and we improved the licensing times from over 14 months for a fund to come in and obtain licensing to less than six months. So we're making program improvements. Um, we're doing greater outreach to the LP and the GP community. So part of, um, I think, achieving those results of double the number of funds in half the time was not a result of easing any sort of the um, application process with respect to licensing, but what we did is just really double down on our efforts of uh, better outreach. So we're, we're reaching out to the community, um, always willing and very excited to talk to funds that might be interested in joining the SBIC program. Um, they're evaluated on uh, metrics from, uh, we evaluate the managers, uh, what is their previous track record and um, their fund strategy. We look at the portfolio, portfolio performance of their previous funds, um, and again, their investment strategy. <coughs> So the second program within our office that I'd, I'd like to talk about is the Small Business Innovation Research Program. So the SBIR program has also provided funding to some very well-known companies, Symantec one in the day, and uh, Genentech also received SBIR funding. So this program sets aside 2.5% of the extramural R&D budgets from the federal agencies with the largest R&D budgets. So there are 11 different agencies. This ranges from Department of Defense is the largest to HHS, Health and Human Services, Department of Energy, Department of Education. I don't think I can rattle off all 11 off the top of my head. But um, last year, over $2.5 billion was, was authorized through the SCPIR program. And one statistic I read is that $1.7 billion um, was invested in early stage VC. So vis-a-vis -vis early stage VC, the SBIR program is really important. And we're seeing, um, I personally have a friend actually from undergrad who's at a company who's been funded through SBIR, and I think this is um, a very important program for early stage high technology businesses. Um, so within the SBIR, I want to just highlight some of the efforts that we've had over the last year. Um, in true Silicon Valley uh, nomenclature, we've termed this effort SBIR 2.0. And we've uh, based this on three different pillars. So we're focused on making this program more entrepreneur friendly. So that means um, as opposed to if you're a robotics uh, company, you. instead of going to every different 11 different agency and seeing what are their robotics solicitations. So Francis, you um, have the Last year, five different agencies did one so joint solicitation on robotics. So this improves the process from your perspective. We're also do, uh, <laughs> focusing on streamlining and simplifying processes. So the 11 different agencies that participate in this program all have different legal authorities, but there are probably still ways that we as the SBA who sort of authorize and administer this program can make sure that we're simplifying some of the contract processes, um, looking at trying to encourage all the participating agencies to decrease the time. I think the number one um, issue that we hear about is it takes too long. So it takes too long from application close to selection of the winning SBIR companies. It also takes too long from the time a company is notified that they've won an SBIR grant or contract to the time they obtain their funds. So let's corral the different agencies, make everybody commit to reducing those timelines. Um, and lastly, just increasing transparency. So there is a system online right now where someone can go in and look at the SBIR funding in their states. Um, there's a one-year fiscal year lag on it. Let's make sure that data is up to date. Let's make sure that um, we're holding the firms that are obtaining SBIR money accountable. So I think there's a lot of fantastic research being done. There's also some companies that are coming in for funding, and you know we want we just want to make sure that there are results on the on the SBIR months that are monies that are being distributed. And lastly, across both programs, and I think across the SBA at large, and I think across the administration on a couple of the interagency initiatives that I work on along with um, Ronnie Chatterjee, who you all heard from earlier today, we really want to celebrate entrepreneurship more broadly. And so uh, within the SBIR program, we are reinstating the, um, an annual awards. It's called the Tibbetts Awards for a gentleman who helped found the um, SBIR uh, award or the SBIR program back in the day. And so we want to just make sure that 
entrepreneurs like yourselves that are really succeeding are being highlighted in the press, are being highlighted across um, the community to talk about not only what can the SBIA program, SBIR, SBIC do to help your companies start, scale, and sell, um, but also just to make sure that your company names are getting out there. And so um, happy to take any questions at the end, but really focused again on high growth, high impact entrepreneurs and, and think the SBA um, can be a relevant partner and we're always looking for suggestions on how to be a better resource for all of you. Thanks very much, Ellen. And uh, before we get to our final speaker um, and start taking some Q&A, I did want to point out Wendy here who's got a lot of forms that are very similar to the, uh, exactly the same ones actually that we use in the opening plenary. So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll get you a form. We'll take it down. We'll, uh, we'll start doing some good Q&A in just a minute. Um, but before we do that, we have one last speaker and uh, we're actually really fortunate to have the speaker because he's going to provide a little different perspective than what you've heard so far. Um, Brendan Kim is general partner and co-founder of Altos Ventures, which is an investment company focusing on areas of wireless communication and enterprise software. He's also uh, a member of the board of the National Association of Investment Companies and a founding director and former president of the Korean American Society of Entrepreneurs. Uh, we've asked Brendan to come because we think it'd be great to hear um, from an investor's perspective of kind of what happened from their perspective uh, during the last couple of years when we saw so much uh, lending and credit tightening and also kind of what, uh, we, what he has done at his company to, to, to find those great startups that, that are the next Googles and Facebooks that Ellen was talking about earlier and, and what they're trying to do and what you guys can maybe do with your companies to help get yourselves on the radar. So um, Brendan, if you want to come on up or speak sure. from the podium, it'd be great. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I, I thank the uh, White House Initiative on, uh, a, a, is it APPI? Did I get that right? APPI. APPI, uh, for having me here. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, everybody's heard the same, same thing, that it's been a, a really tough couple of years for um, small businesses and for entrepreneurs in general. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly with that. Um, it's certainly been tough for companies in our portfolio to weather the storm. Um, having said that, though, I think there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel and that things are beginning to improve this year. Actually, I think starting uh, beginning last year, we saw a lot more activity in the venture sector. Um, when the recession really hit and it became apparent that really was a recession, uh, everybody pulled back, not only the uh, debt providers, but certainly venture folks as well. Um, and the primary reason for doing that was because uh, we wanted to take care of our own. So the venture companies... Um, were focused on their own portfolios, making sure that their own portfolios, because they had less access to debt, because they were going to go through this recession, and nobody knew how long that recession was going to be. Uh, every, you know, there was talk of depression, uh, and so everybody pulled back, um, and perhaps uh, you, uh, some would say too severely, uh, for, looking uh, back in hindsight, do, with hindsight. Um, but as a result, I think uh, you know, venture investors really pulled back a lot, looked at their own portfolios, looked at sort of how could they weather the storm. They saw exit windows lengthening as well. Um, you know, the, the, um, the way the venture industry works is that we only make money if there's an exit environment that's, that's good, whether it's in the terms of M&A or in terms of um, uh, public companies. Um, and so with that exit window lengthening, the recession coming on, um, everybody was like, okay, let's take, make sure there's enough money for the companies we've already invested in and not so much about new companies. Um, but beginning last year, we saw a change in that. There, there, there um, was a little bit more visibility on what the recession was going to look like, how long it was going to be last. It wasn't going to be as severe. And for technology companies in Silicon Valley in particular, I think they are uh, weathering the storm. This particular recession much better than certainly when the dot-com bubble happened. That was a lot worse for Silicon Valley. Um, so with, uh, with things starting to improve a little bit, I think the purse strings start to open up a little and people start to invest again. But the investing character, I think, changed a bit. Um, the investing characteristics, certainly from uh, our perspective, changed as well in that we were now looking for companies that were uh, perhaps a little bit more capital efficient. Um, so the investment dollar amounts got a little smaller. 
Um, and uh, there, was, there was more expectation on the part of venture investors to see more progress in the companies that we were willing to invest in, um, which was tough on entrepreneurs still. Um, it was sort of like, you know, we, companies would come in and say, we want to get big, and we'd say, we believe you want to get big. Show us that you're going to get big by getting some traction. And, well, we can get traction if you give us money. Well, show us traction and we'll give you money. Um, that's always the problem, right? Um, and so, but, the, but I think venture investors in general were seeing that, look, in this environment, uh, we want to make sure that we're funding companies that really uh, are going to be careful with their, with their capital. Uh, in uh, previous environments when the economy was very strong, when exit environments in particular were very strong, particularly during the, uh, the peaks, uh, that was not an issue. We all knew that things would work out someday, um, but in this kind of environment, there's a lot more focus on uh, making sure that capital is being spent wisely. Um, the other thing that we saw, too, is that for technology startups in general, it is a lot cheaper to get going. Um, you know, when I look back, when we first started Altos in 96, uh, to get a properly financed, uh, whether it was a consumer internet company or enterprise company, it took several million dollars. Um, and, you know, uh, raising $20 million, $40 million, you know, a lot of companies did that. In today's environment, uh, it's very different. At least from our perspective, it's very different. It shouldn't take you that much money to get to a position where you know whether your idea is going to work or not. And typically, we would say you, would, you need much less than half a million dollars, uh, perhaps even less than that, maybe $250,000. If you're a consumer internet-focused company, you should be able to see if your concept has legs, if, you're, if your business has legs, if you can get traction, you should be able to get traction on that amount of capital. If you're enterprise-focused, that's a whole different story. And with enterprises, you can have enterprise traditional sales models with a big sales team, all those kinds of things, and, and then a direct sales force. That takes a lot more a lot more financing. If you're enterprise, more sort of SaaS-oriented, a service as a software-oriented, more consumerish kind of enterprise, then it should take you a lot less. But in general, all, across all these categories, we're seeing that because of the improvements in technology, because of cloud computing, because you can take a lot of your, what used to be fixed cost expenses and make it variable, you should be able to see traction with a lot less capital. So that's also informed our decision-making process and, this, and said that Look, uh, you, you shouldn't need to raise a lot of capital in this kind of environment to, to, make, to see if your ideas work or not. Um, the third thing I would say that's different about today's environment is also, uh, and maybe not so much apparent to entrepreneurs, uh, is that there are some pressures being placed on venture capitalists as well. So uh, although we'd like to think so, we are not the kings of the universe. We don't have access to ready capital on our own. We take, we take money from other people. We take money from institutions and we invest on their behalf. And so when we look at um, you know, who are the guys that are funding venture capital, uh, certainly there's the SBA and their, through their SBIC programs, but also uh, more, uh, uh, more commonly it's pension funds and uh, other sort of institutions, uh, whether it might be endowments. And all those companies are looking at venture capital as an asset class and looking at the performance over the last 10 years. And certainly it was great during the bubble, but over the last 10 years, the performance in venture capital has not been as, uh, as spectacular. Um, and so their allocations to venture capital have shrunk. And so they're putting out less money to venture capital. Um, you used to have a lot of funds that are raising large size funds that would go out there and raise a billion dollars in venture capital. And that's not so much happening anymore. Uh, so you have much smaller amounts being raised. And so as a result, fund sizes are coming down. And so if you have fund sizes that are coming down, you're going to have uh, investment sizes that are also coming down as well. The last thing I will say about, um, uh, about, the, about the industry as a whole um, is that there's also a migration. Um, to the extent that funds are still large and that there's still a lot of capital out there, um, there's a migration, as was mentioned earlier, uh, towards maybe uh, li different stages of, of, of companies. And so uh, for, um, uh, for the larger, more established funds that I would say are, have fund sizes that are greater than half a, million, half a billion dollars, uh, but certainly even funds that are over $300 million, I would say they're looking more towards develop, uh, putting their money to uh, work at later stages. And so they're looking for uh, more progress. They're looking for investing in companies that have a lot more revenues, uh, that are showing a lot more traction. They're, so they're showing, uh, you know, uh, companies that have several million in revenues, and a lot of the money is being focused in that direction. Luckily, over the last year to two years, 
uh, you're seeing a lot of new venture capital companies being formed, new venture funds awesome. that are being formed because there is this vacuum in that early stage, that Perfect. seed stage and series A stage that are um, uh, forming to uh, particularly invest in, in those areas. And so as you look across, as you look at accessing venture capital, I think the number one thing to, that I always tell uh, entrepreneurs is that, number one, uh, uh, not all businesses are right for venture capital. So you should, you should understand that as you go in. Um, and that the bar for, that the kind of investments, it's not so much that, that venture capitalists, that you, you're not a good business if you, if you can't get venture capital. You're just not the kind of business that venture capitalists want. And the venture capitalists have a certain kind of return bar, return horizon that they're looking for. Um, and there are certainly tons of great businesses that, have been, that are around um, that have taken no venture money and certainly very, very large businesses um, uh, that have taken no venture money. So venture money is not the only way to go. Um, and there are, certain, again, there are businesses that are just not right for venture capital. And two, venture capital is very, very expensive. Um, you're giving up equity. You're giving up ownership in your company. Um, you're taking on a partner. You're forever losing complete control of your company. Even if your venture investor is only a 20% or a 15 or a 10% shareholder, you still lose control. That 10% shareholder as a venture cap, uh, as an institutional investor, um, if you go to, if you uh, don't get along, and it can create a lot of problems for you at the end. Uh, you know, when you, when you're, especially if you're looking for follow-on financing, any follow-on financing will look to the venture capitalist or that institutional investor and ask questions about what, you know, how has the business been doing? What do you think about the business? Any loans that come through from uh, from banks. Um, they'll call them as a reference. So again, they're really a partner in your business, and so it's again very expensive uh, uh, venture money, but uh, uh, capital to take. But let's say you decide that you do want to do those things. I would say do your homework. Uh, you know, there are a lot of venture capitalists out there, a lot of venture capital firms. You really have to do your homework. It's all about fit at the end of the day, and so going to the websites, uh, networking, figuring out. Which kind of venture, which venture firms might be interested in the sectors that you're operating in is, is, is very important. And not only looking at what kind of firms, but also the particular partner is very important. You could get into a firm and spend hours with the, with the wrong partner and not get the deal done at the end of the day. Whereas if you find the right partner who has an interest in your business, you can get the deal done uh, very, very quickly. Um, so again, it's all about doing your homework. You can go through and look at the list of companies that, uh, that are on the website, go through press releases to figure out what size of investments they're doing, what sectors they're investing in. Um, all those things can really narrow your search and make that um, uh, fundraising process a lot easier. So that, that's the number one thing I, I tell entrepreneurs is to do their homework. Thank you. so much, Brendan, and sorry, I've been feverishly running around back and forth trying to sort some of these great questions that you guys have asked, um, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, I think I would like to start to, uh, with a question that gets into the issue that both Mark and Brendan have talked about, which is kind of preparing your company um, to present it to uh, a lender or to a VC firm or to an equity firm. Um, we've got a question here about um, if someone could elaborate on the financing and funding, um, this one specifically related to the real estate sector. They mentioned that um, they run an interior design company and they've had uh, trouble in the last couple of years getting consideration for a loan. Um, I, mean, I know we touched a little bit about um, TNA, you know, technical assistance, uh, and about you know making your company marketable. Um, and I'm just wondering, Mark, if you might um, elaborate a little bit on just what resources really are out there. We talked about the resource partners that SBA works with. If you could talk a little more about that and what they do and how they do it, uh, I think that'd be a great insight. Sure, and uh, for, those, for those businesses that are a service business like that, uh, a lot of it is really about being understanding of what it is from a finance point of view a lender is looking for. Um, anybody who is in the construction industry or in the uh, home improvement, building trades, those are tough industries in this environment. The, you know, the economy uh, is tough, but the economy for uh, construction is really tough. 
So a lot of this is really making sure that you're really prepared, understanding from a bank's point of view that they start off with a concern about whether or not the, the industry itself is, is strong enough. And then they want to see about you as an individual business what the strengths that you have. So assume that you're going to come in with a better understanding of how you can demonstrate that you have the cash flow to repay any loans. Uh, one of the, the problems that small businesses have had who have lost access to their credit lines and other sources of financing is really being able to make sure that you can demonstrate to a lender how it is that you're going to have the repayment ability to make sure that you can repay a loan that they are looking to make to you. So a key to this piece is really sitting down, having a really well thought through business plan, making sure that the presentation that you're going to be making to a lender is something that you have really the, the, it mapped out from the point of view of, of understanding what it is that you're looking to use the money for and looking for the way uh, that you're going to be able to repay it. And then from a lender's point of view, what's their other avenue if they cannot get uh, a repayment through the business. In other words, what other collateral uh, that you should have? You should assume that as a small business uh, person, you're going to be expected to personally guarantee a loan. There's really no non-recourse kind of financing for small business financing. You're going to personally guarantee a loan and that they're going to look for collateral if it's available. In the construction trade industry, uh, it's a tough industry right now. A lot, of, a lot of it's going to be a question of whether or not you can really show that you have an ability to demonstrate where the, where the ultimate sale is going to be of the product that you're going to be manufacturing. If you're going to be a, a construction business building out a new project, spec projects are going to be really tough. Um, it's going to really, a lot of it depend on showing that you really have an ability to, to really sell the product that you're putting online. So a lot of it becomes a case that a, a small business development center in the Bay Area is a good place to go. Um, some of our other nonprofits are also good to help you get some advice about packaging your financing need. That's great. Um, and how can they find out where their closest SBDC or small business development center is? Uh, to uh, uh, and that's that uh, Chris has prompted me to say on the SBA website is really where you want to go. Um, so he's not, he's not telling me that I should have uh, reminded everybody to go on the SBA.gov website. Look for the district office um, uh, page on that, which is the San Francisco district. Or if you're outside of the Bay Area, the same thing applies in other areas as well. Great. Thanks so much um, for that. And uh, I don't know if anyone else wanted to tackle any part of that question, but I think Mark did a very succinct job of kind of explaining what resources are out there for, for everyone here who's looking to uh, increase their marketability. Uh, another question that we received is uh, actually a really, pretty, really good one. Uh, while, small business while small businesses face tightening credit, lenders like us, and by us they mean non-FDIC finance lenders, are also having difficulty letting the business owners know that, access, um, that they have access to our capital programs. Can you help to improve this area? How and who should we contact for this? I'm just wondering if anyone here would like to speak a little bit about um, non-FDIC insure, uh, non insured uh, financial lenders and, and the key role they play in, in the market. Yeah, let me, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in on that. One of the things that SBA recognizes is that uh, that there's a wide range of sources of financing a small business. So one of the things that we do in the information that we provide to the public um, is really not just the SBA lenders, which are the, obviously the SBA programs, but also some of the non-bank sources of financing. Uh, for small businesses that are looking for financing now, a lot of them are looking for really alternative financing sources. So we try to provide that kind of information. So if you are out there and do financing, uh, you should let us know about this because we let the public know if an SBA product isn't a good fit for them. And it could be for a variety of reasons that that could be the case. They could be a fine business but don't meet the SBA criteria. From a regulated lender's point of view, they may not fit as a regulated lender type credit, but they might fit fine for some of the alternative financing sources. Peer-to-peer -peer lending is something that we let people know about microfinancing, some nonprofit financing, other organizations that do receivable financing. There's a variety of other sources of financing that small businesses should think about and be aware of. So if you are aware of and if you're a, uh, a source of financing for small business that is a non-FDIC, non-regulated uh, lender type institution, we'd like to know about it because from our point of view, our job is not just to talk about the SBA programs. It's really to talk about whatever is the right thing for your business. If I could just add, so, you know, that's one of the things that w when we held meetings across the country uh, asking um, banks and, and non-banks uh, and, and s support services, how do you coordinate? I mean, the, one, one of the big challenges was that they don't coordinate on, on, as, as a whole. And so um, California or the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco has organized a, a small business task force that Mark is, is a part of. 
But the idea is um, either using the Federal Reserve uh, platform or through other ways to organize and, and to be able to develop a, a network of, of um, uh, groups that provide complementary type services, whether it's um, uh, technical assistance or uh, bank funders or non-bank funders. All these have, have a, a role within the, the types of financing that small businesses need, and so we want to continue to encourage those kinds of collaborations. Thanks so much. Um, our next question is directed to Ellen Kim, and it's uh, related to SBIR. Uh, what is the targeted timelines for SBIR funding to reach the entrepreneurs? So that's a great question. Um, I'm going to dance around it a little bit, uh, which is partly because it really is dependent upon the 11 different participating agencies. So SBA has policy oversight over the program, but ultimately we are not uh, making any of the decisions at the different agencies. So, and as you can imagine, a decision for uh, the Department of Defense for a national security concern technology is going to be a very different process from evaluating, say, a wind farm uh, or an energy technology at Department of Energy. And I think those have very different timelines. Um, two points I will make. One is that, um, rest assured, I think that these evaluation panels, what I've learned uh, as I sort of um, have have become more familiar with the SBA and just sort of all these programs and, and really start to make these process improvements is that SBIR uh, applications are evaluated by a third party um, group of external panelists. These evaluation panels uh, consist of not bureaucrats, but leading academics, leading scientists, um, and leading professionals from the fields uh, that pertain to the particular application. And then I think the other point that I would make is on the SBIR 2.0 effort, like I said before, I think there are two different parts to the timeline. One is the time between application deadline and selection, and then selection to disbursement of funds. Within the SBIR 2.0 effort, we've decided as a group to focus on that first part of the equation, which is application close to, uh, to selection of the winners, um, really because I think that's where companies can then hear we need to move on and find financing elsewhere, or you know, at least after you've heard yes or no, then you know which path you're going to go down, which is wait for the government funds or go out and find fun fi financing elsewhere. Um, so I don't have an exact answer for what is the commitment. We are still um, working with the program managers at each of the 11 agencies to really get commitments from everyone, um, but it is a, a tangible, real decrease in the number of days, if not months, uh, for that process from, con from application close to selection. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I just had a little uh, whisper in my ear saying that uh, lunch is soon to be served, so I don't want to keep anyone from the food because we've already had a long day, at least I have. I'm from the East Coast, so it's been a long <laughs> one. But um, I did want to take two seconds to mention just a couple of things, and one is that um, uh, I want to thank um, SBA Administrator Mills, Karen Mills, and Deputy Administrator Marie Johns for their leadership. Um, one thing that they have been leading a lot in is our efforts on underserved markets. Uh, Elizabeth Eccles mentioned this. One of those pieces that, was, that is being focused on is lending and getting lending out into communities that are traditionally underserved. Um, if you're interested, www.sba.gov has some information on some new lending programs that are coming out, including one called Community Advantage that's focused towards um, mission-focused financial institutions, community development financial institutions, certified development companies, nonprofits. So fitting into the question before, um, the one that I asked uh, Ellen on SBIR, there is a concerted effort to help here, and there's also a concerted effort to hear your voices. Um, so we, have the, we at the SBA have formed the uh, National Advisory Council on Underserved Communities. Uh, it's a council that's focused on hearing the voices of minorities, women, veterans, people who live in rural areas, people who traditionally live in areas that are hard hit, um, the hardest hit when times are hard. Um, and if you're interested in that, again, please go to our website and uh, you'll learn more information. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking some time um, and really <laughs> answering some questions. We're here and available. Thank you all so much for your time.